Hello everyone, it's Angela and we're back. I am so excited. This is such a great way to start our lives and get ourselves back there, out there, visiting with you. I have with me today my very special friend, Cheney McKnight of Not Your Mama's History, which I'm sure you've heard of. She is an educator, an interpreter, and a historian who specializes in black folks in America. And we're here today with all kinds of good things to talk about, yes, exciting things. And for starters, you can see us, we're like not six feet apart. Mm -hmm. We are both COVID tested, all is right with the world. No worries, yes, Absolutely. because because my Taney comes from uh, Manhattan, so <laughs> oh yeah, yeah come. so she, she she spends a lot of time testing, right? Yes, I do yeah. all the time. <laughs> yeah, so but we are here today, um, number one, to say hello because we've missed you guys. You know, it's been a a, a long winter, <laughs> and it still is kind of winter, but we're hoping spring will be here soon, and we have something very special that we want to announce. Yep. Burnley and Trowbridge has collaborated with Not Your Mama's History, and we have produced something really unique, special, and we hope life-changing for a lot of people. Absolutely, right? absolutely. So we have um, we have developed this project. This is Cheney's vision, and I'm going to turn it over to her because she's going to tell you a little bit about the project. And then we're going to announce the project, right? right absolutely. So. so when I started in living history, I um, I would ask around about how can I get started in um, finding items for my impressions as a black woman, whether it was a free black woman or enslaved. And I constantly got answers like, Oh, don't worry about it. Black women wore just the poorer versions of what white women were wearing in the 18th and 19th century. And instantly I was like, hmm, that does not make sense. And then I would go to Sutler Rose and I would speak with people who were reproducing items. Um, very rarely did I come across someone who was not white reproducing items. And so they, most if not all of those reproductions um, were from a very Eurocentric perspective. And that's because there weren't a lot of people who weren't white reproducing items. There were some people, let me put that out there. There yeah. were some people, uh, but those were in very small batches and individuals. But when you're looking at where can I go to purchase uh, reproduction items for my kid? Yeah. There weren't, we looked, there, there wasn't, weren't. There, yeah. there and there, were there wasn't an understanding, really. Yeah. There wasn't an understanding. And and this idea that, um, uh, I, I, I was, I'm hoping that this uh, collaboration mm -hmm. will also educate people on how to collaborate with interpreters and living historians of color um, to whether they are indigenous, black, uh, Latina, Latino, Asian. Um, please collaborate with these people. Um, please do not just um, recreate items in a vacuum yeah. because the context matters and we'll show you yes. how it really was actually important in our collaboration. Yeah. Um, I think there's actually, a question. yeah, there was a question uh, from our viewers uh, that submitted via our form last week, kind of talking about this where they were really wondering how were black people in particular, the enslaved community able to express and honor their unique heritage in their fashion choices. Okay. Um, so can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, definitely. Um, I, I, I really find that it was more so about resisting and holding on, resisting the erasure of um, their culture. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think in getting oneself through the day, both free black and enslaved Africans in America utilize little items, such as um, 
even little charms that mm -hmm. they would wear, jewelry, yep. jewelry um, earrings as ways to hold on. Food ways is a mm -hmm. big way in which Black folks were holding on to their culture as well mm -hmm. as helping each other get through the day. Right. And as many of you know, if you follow, have been following me over the years, I am the queen of head wraps. Yes. Uh, specifically, I um, started reproducing head wraps um, a long time ago, about, um, it's been about 10 years yeah, now it's been 10 that years. I've been putting out videos <laughs> about head wraps. Wow. When you Done a huge back. amount of research. <laughs> right. And, and, and Cheney has found things that I didn't even know existed. <laughs> it's really been exciting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, um, I, I reached out to Angela and was like, I think head wraps is that connection that we can use specifically to um, help black interpreters, black reenactors to uh, connect with the yes. material culture of black folks from that period. Um, and so we came up with, well, I, I brought to her three different women or uh, three different eras, three yeah. different places. Uh, so we start, I started in South America. There was a painting by um, Carlos Julio. Yeah, which I think Christina I can, can put, put that up, up on for the you. screen, yeah. yeah. This is from uh, the late 18th century in Brazil, yeah. South America. Can you go back just a little mm -hmm. bit? We just had a sound cut out. Mm -hmm. um, just talk about the, the image and okay. the head wrap. Yeah. Um, okay. So it was so, oh. such a perfect uh, image. Um, and you see a woman. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can see a woman with a sprig printed red printed head wrap mm -hmm. and right away I knew I wanted that I <laughs> that was the right up my alley um, it was South American mm -hmm. and a lot of prints that made it to uh, South America make it everywhere remember this is on the same route uh, so you see prints throughout but uh, this is from Brazil the artist is Carlos Julio. Yeah, Julio. And I think it's so perfect for interpreting in South America, the West Indies, uh, and throughout North America. Mm -hmm. This is perfect. Uh, then we have um, the next one is Mrs. Juliette Toussaint, who was married to Pierre Toussaint. Yeah. Uh, who was a hairdresser. He was a hairdresser in New York City. Very a very wealthy man uh, so they had a little bit of cash <laughs> uh, and uh, this this painting you can find it uh, I think there may be a link you yeah can we'll find. have a link below for yeah. you it's uh, a beautiful you, painting and I'm sure yeah. many of you are familiar with Probably, it yeah, yeah. Uh, you can find it in New York Historical Society uh, I have been reproducing this head wrap for the style of the head wrap. Well, no, I've been reproducing this. Well, not the actual fabric. Yeah. But I've been trying to find that, that fabric, that fabric mm -hmm. for years. Like every store I went into, every fabric store, if it was anywhere close, if it had some of the colors in it, I was like, give me a yard. Give me two <laughs> yards of that. And um, some of you years ago would have seen me re trying to recreate this head wrap over and over again. And that was the second one I brought. I was like, we need this mm -hmm. because it's really also a lot of other um, black female reenactors have been trying to reproduce that. And then the last one is probably one of my faves. Okay, I said this about H1. They're all my favorites, but this but one is pretty special. Yeah. yeah, and they all have a different reason yeah yeah um so the last one was new york so we have we're up in the north now let's go back down south mm -hmm. um so i look through the wpa narratives and oh, i, I knew my book and i knew that my um 
I knew that my uh, Civil War and mid 19th century folks really would have loved a, a head wrap as well. So it was really looking at uh, plantation made um, homespun, mm -hmm. homespuns and cloths. And I looked into the WPA narratives and just sent <laughs> narrative after narrative. To and they're Florida. all so <laughs> great. No, but they were all so great because the narratives talk about colors and they talk about um, mm -hmm. the dye stuffs they're using mm -hmm. and you know and they do give descriptives mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know like a gay color and and a dark color together yes. in mm -hmm. in stripes and we have a you couple know. of those too yeah we do yeah. Put up. Mm -hmm. and so um, miss millie evans yeah. yeah let's put up millie um she talks about um she she says i'll tell you how to die yeah. A little beech bark dyes, slate, a slate color uh, set with coppers, hickory bark and bay leaves dye yellow set with chamber lye, bamboo dyes turkey red set color with copper, pink uh, straw dyes purple set color with chamber lye. To dye cloth brown, we would take the cloth and put it in water with leather that le leather had been tanned in and let it soak then set the color with apple vinegar. Yeah. So very so descriptive. Just, yeah, and mm -hmm. a lot of creative. I mean, they use different types of dye stuffs depending on what was local mm -hmm. to them. And the fact that, for example, she mentions the bamboo, mm -hmm. which grows wild here. Yes. Um, and we have bamboo everywhere. And the fact that they utilized it, they mm -hmm. could take these locally grown things and turn them into these beautiful, so beautiful. colors. And, yeah. and then just uh, the way in which they would uh, check and stripe the fabrics was also very unique and they talk about that as well. Um, Lucy Norfleet, mm -hmm. all of our clothes, oh, so no Lucy Norfleet was from Mississippi. Mm -hmm. All of our clothes was made on the place. The cloth was woven right there too. That the dresses for the women was beautiful. One dark stripe and one bright stripe. Folks them days know how to mix pretty colors. Yeah. And so there are just lots of, <laughs> there are lots of these descriptions. So we had something yeah, to go on. Yeah, we had something of. to go on. There, um, there had to be a lot of creativity, but there yeah. was also things to go so, on. So we, um, and you know, we before I talk about how we did mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. you said a little bit about what you wanted mm -hmm what your reasoning was behind doing these three handkerchiefs. Mm -hmm. How did you want to impact the community uh, by doing this? What do you really want this to be? I'm really hoping that it will provide black interpreters with a connection mm -hmm. um, with, uh, with their, with their um, African and black American roots and material culture like very much it's very tangible exactly. this is something this is reproduced from something we know that black people were wearing and exactly. styling and and styling in very unique ways right and it's not it's not the generic you know euro clothing mm -hmm. styling it's right. it's looking at the colors it's looking at the style and it's making yeah. it distinct yeah give well yeah. And I think they weren't just like, I want to be different. I want to be flashy. They were, they had a different eye. They mm -hmm. were seeing it through a different lens. Right. So um, I, it's not that a European lens is bad. No. It's just that it's different from a um, Afro-Latino eye. It's different from a Af Black American eye. It's the culture comes through and the way people are styling their garments. Exactly. And I think that's the coolest part. Of, it is. Um, because we're going to see also how people are going to be styling it as well and um, how they're going to be researching and styling. Mm -hmm. I also am hoping that this is going to be kind of a blueprint for other businesses to maybe collaborate with people from other communities as well. Mm -hmm. um, there, I, I, I always say um, that no one living today legally enslaved people in America yeah. unless you have some really great cream, face cream, 
<laughs> you weren't here. Um, but I think that there are ways in which we can do things that we can do um, to help bring people in, into the living history community and the reenactor community um, and help help them push forward in these yeah. communities. I agree. A hundred percent. And it's one of the reasons why I was 110% on board, right? <laughs> Us as friendly, besides the fact that we're friends. Right, right. It was just, and I've always been so impressed with Cheney's mission um, from the very beginning. Thank you. And I believed in you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> and I believed and, in you. And, and she's proven it. And it's a great mission. And I'm mm -hmm. seeing, you know, it's a grassroots movement that I have seen grow mm -hmm. and become. And we want it to keep moving mm -hmm. forward. Absolutely. Because we want to tell the whole story. Absolutely, right. the full story, and invite people in yes. who don't see themselves in living history. I'm so excited about that. Um, so I'm going to talk. A little oh, bit go about right how it came to be. Yes, <laughs> go ahead, go for it. How it came to be because we <laughs> talked a lot, but um, there were a lot of pra practical aspects. Mm -hmm. As Cheney and I started talking about this project, she told me her inspiration. Um, mm -hmm. I am going to cut for one minute. Are you having a small talk? I'm sure you're going to need to go to the chat. Okay. Or can uh, anybody speak to it on, uh, on I, chat? I will go to it right now. Is um, it? I think what I'm going to do is I need to switch out to microphone for a second. Okay. okay. Well, I will entertain you while Cheney <laughs> is switching out her microphone. Um, but, you know, Cheney and I talked uh, quite a bit. Um, she talked about her vision. Um, I'll show you a great drawing she did for me <laughs> soon. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> so enlightened by them and found so much information in it because, you know, I am a textile nerd. And mm -hmm. so anything to do with textiles, I'm all over it. Is it? We're sorry, you guys. As usual, we're having technical <laughs> difficulties with the chat. First, I'm going to say sorry, as always, we, we seem to um, have, it's called Burnley and Tilbridge Live Technical Difficulties Always. Not sometimes, always. I don't know why, but we do. Um, if you can hear me, I hope you can hear me. I think that Christine is working on it. I don't know that I should continue right now because I really want to share this with all of you. Um, so I'm just going to fill this up with gibberish for the moment <laughs> until we make sure that all of our mics are working, et cetera, et cetera. So, Cheney, what did you have for lunch? Oh, my goodness. Blaze Pizza. Uh -huh. Let me tell y'all, that is my favorite commercial. restaurant. <laughs> That's my favorite rest, one of my favorite places. I yeah. had a lot of great memories here. Yes. <laughs> and I have Blaze Pizza, too, of course. <laughs> it's delicious. I had artichokes on mine. And it, oh, I had pesto it's cheese. Pesto. And um, what do we have for breakfast? Ooh, we had Emily's donuts. We are not doing a, uh, we're not being sponsored <laughs> by these people, okay? Just so you right, know. right, just so but, you know, yeah, unfortunately. But Emily's donuts, we, because I overheard <laughs> Cheney say something about maple bacon, and I was like, surprise! So there was maple bacon, and she right. was like over herself, right? <laughs> I love maple, maple oh, bacon donuts. I would have never thought that you could put bacon, <laughs> on a donut and like right. it tastes good and it's 
Mm -hmm. in their state. Oh, they God. also make, well, not anyways, um, there are also maple bacon shakes out there as well. What? Yes. No, no, It no. sounds disgusting, but it is delicious. Where have you gotten them at? Where? I, I cannot even remember. Oh, I know that it was somewhere in New York. Oh, I'll drive to New York. Side. Right. It's delicious. Send me one. <laughs> oh, it'll be put, soup. Yeah. <laughs> put it in one of those freeze-dry things. Mm -hmm. How are we doing, Christina? I think we might be back. Okay. Are we back? I think we're back. Hello, hello. Are we hello? back? So nobody oh. can hear anything. You're both back. Okay. okay. Can you hear us now? We would like to see resounding yeses. And I, we, I can hear you now. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we were talking about lunch. We weren't talking Don't. about anything important. <laughs> we were just giving gibberish to keep things going because we didn't want you to miss anything. <laughs> and we're so sorry. And like one day we're going to have the perfect live where nothing goes wrong. <laughs> I don't know when that'll be. I'm not making promises, yeah. right? It's the laws of lives. Something yeah. has to go wrong. We, Something has to go wrong. And not your mama's history audience as well knows that every time. Every time. There's a, we'll do yeah. all the checks right before. and it Every time. That's <laughs> just the way it is. So where we left off, <laughs> I was talking about the practical aspects of this project. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of conversation between Cheney and I um, she started to send me her inspiration, mm -hmm. so she sent me um, portraits, then she sent me mm -hmm. the WPA, which was so cool. I had not read them, mm -hmm. and I was totally enamored because it was textile nerdishness, yes. which I love. <laughs> um, so those were all great, and those really started to inform me. Um, and then she sent me a drawing. Mm -hmm. Do you have that drawing? Yes. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> drawing? Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, gosh. She asked if she could use her crayon. Did you not tell Cheney you were putting her yes. crayon? Oh, no. Well, I, I, kind of, I kind of threatened her. So, so I, I, I fell through on my threat. I'm sorry. Uh, oh. <laughs> but anyway, so, it was amazing. And I made your crayon drawing. I mean, it's the exact. <laughs> It's the exact what what and I <laughs> thought that that would be <laughs> but what happened during all this talk is as we talked back and forth she knew what she wanted to do she mm -hmm. knew what she was trying to create I also knew how to inform it because mm -hmm, yeah. of all the textile work that I've done all the research that I've done I said you know we have to use certain textiles, we have to use certain colors, right. things like that that are going to be appropriate to yeah. give it more credence, right? Absolutely. We can't say that it's a reproduction in the mm -hmm. sense of it's reproduced from an actual mm -hmm. textile, mm -hmm. but certainly we can say that this is a well-informed yes. um, product, right? Yes, absolutely. And Go ahead. Um, I, I knew that this was something I wanted to do for a long time. So this wasn't really so much a spur of the moment decision. No. Um, and I, I had a vision, but I knew that I needed people who knew what they were doing. <laughs> like, because I wanted them to be right. I wanted to, yeah. um, to look correct. I wanted the weight to feel correct. Um, and so I, I've always used Burnley and Trowbridge um, as my kerchiefs and a lot of my head wraps. So it just, it fell into place. I reached out to Angela and said, I don't know if you'll be interested in this. And I, I have said, uh-huh. <laughs> you were like, uh -huh. keep talking, keep talking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, this has been, this is really, it really has been a fun project for me. I've gotten a lot of, mm -hmm. um, of satisfaction out of it. Wonderful. I was just so excited and pleased as, as wow. the samples started coming. Yeah. Um, but some of the things that we did talk about is we talked mm -hmm. about things like um, price points, you yes. know, all the practical mm -hmm. aspects mm -hmm. because we want to make this available. We want mm -hmm. this to be a thing that everybody can have, right? Absolutely. So those were some of the things that we talked about and we talked about marketing and all mm -hmm. that. Um, so you had said that somebody had asked a question uh, yeah, actually, uh, one of the viewers was wondering 
like what informed the fabric choices for this okay. project? Like, were there certain fabric types used uh -huh. over others uh -huh. mm -hmm. in these types of uh, items, or how does that work? So this is a, a, an excellent way to mm -hmm. segue into beginning to show them yes. the products. So absolutely. <laughs> So I'm going to so hand good. it off to you and let oh you do gosh. it. Now these, I'm going to start by saying these are our samples, so they haven't been hemmed. Um, so they look a little odd, but you will get the gist of what is happening. Yes. I'm going to let you open uh, it up. But I think it's so important for you all to see this bleeding here mm -hmm. um, because it lets you know that, that this these is block are, printed. This is block printed. Mm -hmm. You can see <laughs> exactly where it was printed, block yes. printed down. Yes. It's not perfect. No, it's not perfect. And, and that's what, what you're looking for. So what, this is from the first image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when she talked to me about it, the first thing I said is, during this time, there is a huge amount of Manchester goods yes. being manufactured and printed and exported. It's being used by the East India Company. Mm -hmm. It's being used in the slave market, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think we should print on cotton. Mm -hmm. I think we should have the true linen cotton woven mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. would have been woven for this product. Now when yeah. I say the true linen cotton, yes. I mean a linen warp and a cotton weft. Mm -hmm. I don't mean a mixed fiber. Right. So I had my weaver manufacture this fabric right. and then we talked about the print. And the print is based on one that probably has a 1760s date mm -hmm. to it because the original was some type of little red sprig. And I've studied mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of printed textiles mm -hmm. of the lower sorts. Um, and those textiles, all the sprigs are so varied. There's yes. so many different combinations. Yes. And this is one that when I gave her the image, we had about what, four or five? Yeah. And I said, you tell me. Oh, uh, you tell me which one you love. And she was like, love. I'm sorry. Yes. I keep hugging it. <laughs> so it's like this, this, if you look at it, we'll hold it mm -hmm. together so that yes. they can see. This has got some meat to it, mm -hmm. but it's still going to handle really well Absolutely. as a head wrap. And oh, we yeah. did make them 36 square, which by the way, I will mm -hmm. tell you later with the next one is a very standard size yes. for what we're doing. Yes. So, and, also, and it's historically accurate. This is uh, the size of kerchief that is perfect for me. I have very broad shoulders, yeah. so um, both for my head wraps, tying head wraps. And as a, as a covering. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so this is just. <laughs> and the red is based on all the reds that I've researched. Yes. So it's a true mm -hmm. red for that time frame. And as you all know, um, I love red. And um, so did, um, Af early um, black folks here in uh, in America, you see them. Uh, it's a spiritual color. Mm -hmm. um, it's a fashion color. It, it's connection to both Africa um, as well as culturally to one another. It's amazing. Oh. Where do you want me to put it? Right you can here. just put it on the floor. <laughs> put right on the floor. Throw it on the oh, floor. I, I've got my um, iPad there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. This is the one that made me cry, made Cheney cry, because I was so excited when it got done. Oh my gosh. All right. Okay. All right. This, this is, is Juliet Toulouse. Uh, yep. And we cannot put that picture up. I wish we could because yeah. we will link to it because I just want to say, mm -hmm. bam. Bam! We got right. it dead we on. We did it. We did this it. This is it. Yeah. Now, this, based on the date, this could easily have been a madras. Mm -hmm. Madras was very popular. If Absolutely. you want to do research, um, I've got a couple of links that I will put into mm -hmm. uh, down below as well. Mm -hmm. But the idea was that madras was being manufactured in India early on, mm -hmm. and it was being exported and sent to Africa mm -hmm. in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. And it had already been adopted culturally yes. by the 17th century right. in Africa. Yes. It then became really popular uh, from, a, uh, from a standpoint of world 
interests, you know, mm -hmm. uh, European interests, okay. and began to, began to be exported in that regard. Then it became an important part of the slave trade again. Right. Um, and it and there is one researcher who calls it Rummel's, um, and I could fall under that. But this is Madras. It's a particular okay. type of pattern and the fact that they were woven in cotton. Now there is some weaving in cotton uh, early on in India um, and it is coming into the country, uh, various countries. Africa doesn't have the situation that England does with all of the uh, restrictions. So Africa's getting these beautiful 100% cotton goods right. in the 17th century. And this is a secret of India. This is not something that's being able to be reproduced yeah. elsewhere. Um, at that time, um, so this is a you. This is unique in that mm -hmm. if you are interpreting in West Africa, mm -hmm. which I don't know, there may be some of my friends. I do know yeah. I have some West African interpreters who follow me. So um, if the, you can use this to interpret 17th uh, and 18th century. Mm -hmm. um, Yep. This is perfectly appropriate to interpret um, in West Africa, um, in the West Indies, South America, and North America. Yeah. And, you know, in the 17th century, it would have been worn as a turban, mm -hmm. um, and probably mostly by men. I don't know how mm -hmm. when women are wearing it in the 17th, 18th, uh, in the 17th century. In the 18th century, it's Let's moving see. to head wraps. I'm wait, not wait. familiar. For, okay, so in, in Africa. Say, in Africa, yes. Mm -hmm. In Africa. Uh, so, um, yes, we do have, um, I, I believe I have a painting of a woman in Senegambia with okay. a Madras he uh, head wrap on. And what's the date on it? Um, it's, it, well, it's 1850, it's 1853. Yeah. Um, but you start to see things that look kind of Madrasi by yeah. the um, late 18th century. Right. Well, mm -hmm. I think they're wearing it earlier, but what mm -hmm. I'm saying is they're wearing it slightly different. Absolutely. They're wearing it as turbans um, in the okay. earlier century. Yeah. Um, and then it's evolving into this head wrap. Okay. So, but it's, it's already well indoctrinated into the African uh, culture and yes. their fashion. So yes. their, mm -hmm. their fashion culture. So that's number two. Okay. So this date is 1825 for the portrait, which mm -hmm. we which we tried to duplicate, um, and then our last one, and and I would say you can go earlier with mm -hmm. that as well. You can go earlier like, or later, yeah, because Madras is popular to today, and Absolutely. you see it in Africa today. There are certain yes. types of Madras that are very popular, yes, um, in the community now. So the last one is the one that was strictly taken. Mm -hmm. from a crayon drawing and no I don't mean that strictly no. but it is interpreted from all of these oral yeah. histories and also from the inspiration of a quilt that we looked at yeah. that was made of um, well, well, plantation not, cloth yeah. right um, so what we thought was plantation or cloth let's say cloth made by enslaved persons on a plantation. Okay. Um, and so this, I thought it was very important that um, even though um, this was not produced from um, an original, this was produced from descriptions we had from the WPA narratives and um, put together into the brain of a descendant yeah. and <laughs> with crayons. Yes, yeah, with crayons. <laughs> so there you are. Uh, Aja wants to know, can we order these now? They're uh, not here yet. <laughs> That's why I'm, I'm showing you my samples with all the rough edges. Right, right. Yeah, but they will be here within the month. Yes. That's, that's our hope. We will we, keep you abreast. Yeah, we're having them tagged right now. They're being mm -hmm. stitched right now. Uh, they've all been woven, from what I understand, yes. and that's what we're waiting on at the moment. So it's very exciting. Oh, so funny. These will only be available through Not Your Mama's History and Burnley and Trowbridge. They will yes. not be available elsewhere. So yes. this is something that, that, that we are um, hanging on to. Yes. <laughs> it's our thing. It's, not it's our thing. <laughs> um, this one, just, I love it. I love um, the asymmetry of it. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because I immediately, from a, a consumer standpoint, I tried to put a border on it. Yes. And Cheney goes, no, no, no. They were doing their wraps out of cloth. And no, mm -hmm. no, no. 
Uh, whereas the other one, the madras, mm -hmm. they were actually woven as bolts. Mm -hmm. So it was three, it was three handkerchiefs were woven as yardage mm -hmm. so that they could send them out. They could accept them into the European countries and not pay duty on them because it was fabric, mm -hmm. not a garment. Mm -hmm. So the sneaky peedy, but right, right. you know, <laughs> that's why they did that. And that really was something that became the way that handkerchiefs continued to be woven all the way well mm -hmm. into the 19th century. Um, in fact, if you look at our red, yes, our red reproduction silk um, spotted neckerchief, which comes from uh, Mary, no, not from Mary Deering, from the DAR, you will see a link to a late 19th century bolt of the same fabric right. that was sunk on a steamboat. And so it's, it's, you know, it's something that continues on and on. It has mm -hmm. a long life. Absolutely. Now. But uh, this one, I love the colors of yeah. it. And yes. it's just, it's, it very much speaks to natural dyes. Mm -hmm. um, it is, you know, yes, we are being introduced to other dyes, but this mm -hmm. is something that's homespun. Yeah. So there's a high likelihood that this would have been dyed Absolutely. with natural dyes. So. Absolutely. And so um, the interesting thing, the yarn is the, would have been dyed mm -hmm. and then woven in. It's mm -hmm. <sighs> beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so that is our big reveal you guys we hope you think it's as big as we right. do surprise uh, surprise <laughs> it's not only it's not not only three new things but it's it's something it's a whole new way mm -hmm. that we want to move forward mm -hmm. right absolutely so. uh, we do have a question uh wondering if cheney can speak to uh head wraps and kind of where they were worn were they worn mostly in the south circa mm -hmm. 1770 were they worn in new england enslaved women not enslaved women so we have this little thing that said, who uses it and how, question mark. So now we can right. talk about it. So Cheney, <laughs> take it away. Uh, this is a great question. Um, something that because we've had about 100 years of TV and movies telling us that head wraps are only worn um, by enslaved women, um, I want you, or, or only people in Louisiana, Mm -hmm. I want you to take everything you think you know about head wraps and throw it in the trash mm -hmm. <laughs> because most of it is wrong. Um, so we see head wraps throughout the um, 17th, late 17th, 18th, and 19th century on black women uh, being worn by uh, free black uh, and enslaved women. And sometimes it is a, the majority of the time, it is a racial identifier, um, depending on where you are. Um, black women, especially in the early uh, 19th century, uh, take it on as very much a, a badge of honor. Mm -hmm. It is, they are using it to make different uh, styles because during that time we see white women appropriating turbans um, during that time but when you look at black women's head wraps they're distinctly different you see that they are tied directly onto the head they sit differently and it's a very specific style so if you look at um, Mrs. Juliet Pierre, I'm, I'm sorry, Mrs. Juliet Toussaint, um, you, you can see um, that she is wearing her, ha her head wrap in a style that was very popular, that we see a lot of paintings in mm -hmm. Louisiana, but you also see it in uh, Virginia, South, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, you see it all over the place. It, it was a very popular style. Uh, so if you're doing that head wrap, you're in, uh, you're sitting pretty, but th that's New York. Then moving down to the South, we see enslaved women, obviously they're not going to have um, as much access to uh, different types of fabrics even though they do they we know from store records they're purchasing um, kerchiefs their own by themselves they're purchasing silk cloth um, but when it comes to workwear mm -hmm. 
uh, plantation made homespuns, especially during, um, we see the later half of the 1850s, as well as the uh, into the Civil War. Um, this is what you see a lot of as far as work head wraps. And they get really funky with their colors. Yeah, and well, uh, it, it's, an, it's a way of, of, of expressing themselves too, yeah. to be able to Absolutely. dye the colors and do that kind of thing. And, and again, a way of identifying mm -hmm. and saying, you know, this is me. I'm proud yeah. of me. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and many times these rules are imposed on them. Mm -hmm. um, so they decided, okay, you're going to make me wear this head wrap. I'm going to make this the most beautiful, fabulous out there head wrap. When you, you can't help but see me walking down yeah. the street on my way to a uh, Sunday meeting. Okay. Yeah. Oh, exactly. I, I get so passionate about no, it. But it's true. It's absolutely <laughs> true. And, and that's the thing. And, and that leads us into another thing. Yes. Appropriation. <laughs> yes. So, and that's something very important. Okay. I want to be very specific that um, anyone can wear these kerchiefs as a kerchief. Mm -hmm. Anyone. Everyone, anyone. Um, but there are very specific ways in which black women were tying their um, head wraps during the period. It is appropriation for um, someone who is not of African descent mm -hmm. um, to wear these head wraps, especially when interpreting exactly. in North America. Yeah. Um, I know that there are very specific cases, and in those cases, um, you have to ask yourself, so when you see certain paint, um, paintings and you think you are looking at a white woman, sometimes you are not looking at exactly. someone who was considered to be white mm -hmm. at that time. Um, and it was also appropriation during the time yes. when, when keep that in mind, that it was also appropriation. They were appropriating um, the head wraps of black women in Africa, as well as through the Middle East. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, I mean, it's the, the idea of appropriation is something that has gone on for all times of yeah. taking what belongs culturally to one culture and, mm -hmm. and bringing it to you and, and wearing mm -hmm. it in the same manner or a slightly mm -hmm. different manner. Mm -hmm. um, it's appropriation, yes. uh, period. Um, and I think the important thing to remember too with this um, is as far as, you know, we're giving you a lot of background yeah. on these. Yeah, and that's the way you should wear all your clothing. Yeah. Anything that you're going to interpret, you know, not only by word, but by your visual, mm -hmm. you should be able to back that all up with proper history um, mm -hmm. to to be able to say, this is why I'm wearing this. Yeah. This this says who yes. I am and as a person. Yeah. Um, I think um, also being able to say, I'm, I'm wearing this because his, here's the history and not just because it looks cool yeah, and it makes me exactly. look special or cute. Exactly. This is, this is real tangible yes, material tangible. culture and this is meaningful. Why that is so important yeah. to have that tangible material culture? Um, so thank you for asking that. Um, so much of the um, items we find in museums and collections, yeah. um, it was survival bias, I yes. think that's the term. Um, things survived of the wealthy, of people who exactly. had money, and of items of people that society considered to be important, people of importance. But everyday, average people, everyday right. people. Um, Lower the, sorts, as low, we say in the 18th century. Right, Yeah. Um, enslaved persons, mm -hmm. working people, Free, uh, free black, working white folks. Their items and garments were just, you know. Also, they they use things until they were something like this. Once I can't wear this as a head wrap anymore or a kerchief, this becomes a rag. After it becomes a rag, it may become a nappy. Mm -hmm. Then I'll and cut it, may, it up, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it may become far kindling. You right. know, so it's that kind of thing. Now, now though, with the survival bias mm -hmm. comes another aspect of it. Yeah. And that is the fact that we have confirmation bias. Yes. And um, that's where we may have things that exist, yes. but. <laughs> but um, uh, 
number one, they don't know uh, because they don't have um, a specialist who is familiar with that item. For example, um, I and was we're at, talking like curators, mm -hmm. museums, yes. etc. Mm -hmm. So I was at Stratford Hall and a item in their collection was, was, there was an item that was found in the wall. It was a collection of, you know, pieces of cloth. And in that piece of cloth, there was um, a button, shards of um, pottery, and a crystal that had a cosmogram um, carved into it. <laughs> um, a curator a long time ago classified it as a rat's nest. That a rat, you know, yeah. or a mouse. Scounded all this stuff and put it together. And put it together in a perfect little area. They were very meticulous. They were <laughs> yes, so very, meticulous. Very you know, meticulous. I want to meet this mouse or rat. <laughs> 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 and so, um, but they brought someone in. Um, a friend of mine contacted me and said, um, she started listing off the things that were in the collection. And I said, before she got to it, I said, was there a um, piece of wood with a nail uh, driven into it? And she said, yes, in the collection there is. I said, that was purposely put there. This is um, a fo form of Afri African spiritual practices. They were working the roots. Um, so we don't know exactly what they were trying to do, um, but I think possibly protecting the enslaved persons who are working in the house or trying to shift the minds of the enslavers in that house, who knows? Mm -hmm. um, but if I hadn't, if, um, if Kelly Dietz hadn't have um, been looking at the collection and saying, wait a minute. This doesn't look right. This yeah. doesn't look right and brought in people who know African spiritual practices to have a look at it, it would have just been classified mm -hmm. as a rat's nest that was in the wall. And I think, you know, and, and, and that goes to say mm -hmm. that some of the larger museums, you know, they've gotten a lot better mm -hmm. about uh, doing their due diligence yeah. when it comes to collections. But you still have a lot of little tiny museums out there that have amazing things in their collections, yeah. and they may not even know it. Uh, they yeah. may not. They may have um, something like this. And in, in any number of people, right. it might have been a head wrap. It might have been a kerchief. Yeah. Um, but who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's just, I think, a good example. We can turn and mm -hmm. look back. If you mm -hmm. look back to the blue and white yeah. one, the red and white one here, mm -hmm. and the blue uh, rumble there, those are all from the DAR. Mm -hmm. um, but they don't have any... Uh, provenance. They mm -hmm. don't have any information. We don't mm -hmm. know if they were worn by white people, enslaved people, free people. You know, we don't know. Mm -hmm. But we can go to images and we can see right. something right. like that being right. worn, you know, uh, in um, Bruno's. Yes. His stuff. Yes, <laughs> but right. Anyway, right, right. His stuff. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we can see the images. Uh, so it's it's that kind of thing where mm -hmm. you have to start connecting all those dots. Right. Make those connections. Make those connections. And bring more people to the table. Yes. We have a literal table here. And yes. Angela is bringing more people to the table. Right. This yes. Is it's, it's, well, it's what needs to happen <laughs> everywhere. We do and, have a question mm -hmm. about the red uh, block printed. Yes. Um, is there any symbolism in the motif? Uh, that you can speak to? That's a good question. It w well, as far as this particular motif, it would be more of a, uh, in my opinion, uh, something that was more India-based as far as the aesthetics. And what ended up happening is that there were pure India aesthetic prints coming in, let's say for England, because that's mm -hmm. the focus of a lot of my research along with the Americas. Mm -hmm. um, and what was coming in with this India motif was them being anglicized for the ang for the English taste. Mm -hmm. um, so some of them liked this, but then they would evolve into more floral mm -hmm. types, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Right. This was done aesthetically. Yes, we chose absolutely. it aesthetically. I did. I did. This image does exist. It does. Mm -hmm. It does have a mid-century provenance, mm -hmm. uh, but not in this contextual. Yeah. manner. Okay. I do have to say there, um, I did um, one of the, for me, there are seven um, flowers oh, okay. on this and that was something that I 
And why? Um, um, because in uh, so there's significance in seven in spiritual practices. So, so there, I, I just least... learned something. You didn't tell me that. <laughs> no, no, you but just that was just like one. <laughs> well, that was just one of my. Um, when I initially saw it, I was like, ah, okay, and, and it, that's very cool. And mm -hmm. it is, it, and you're right because it is seven. That is uh, because there's three on one side, mm -hmm. three on the other side, and then the mm -hmm. one at top. Okay. Uh, That's and, cool. And that wasn't the only reason why I picked it, but it was like something I liked the way it looked. And then mm -hmm. when I was like seven, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> so that beautiful. is, that's how that evolved. Um, mm -hmm. American lady says, my mom wore head wraps and I didn't realize that came from our enslaved great grandmothers mm -hmm. uh, and hashtag American descendants of slavery. Yes, absolutely. That's so um, cool. uh, unfortunately, head wraps um, after s enslavement, um, which is wonderful. Yes, end of slavery, woot woot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, um, as black folks were trying to move up in society and provide for their families and gain equality in society, they shunned some of the th identifiers of them, mm -hmm. of their enslavement, or what they perceived to be an identifier mm -hmm. of their enslavement and their difference. Um, so things like head wraps by the mid, um, 20th century had disappeared from public life in black communities. And um, I know for a fact my, um, my family members did wear head, what they called head rags at home, but mm -hmm. they would never wear it out. Even mm -hmm. when I started myself to wear head wraps, my mom was appalled initially. I really? was in college. Oh, she I was didn't know horrified that. <laughs> um, because it had become this cultural thing that you would not wear a head rag out of the house. Um, and so I love that now millennials and Gen Z mm -hmm. have really started to um, embrace um, these head wraps once again and learning how to tie the cultural head wraps and mm -hmm. learning about them. So um, to, I'll put this out there. I do a head wrap lecture where I talk about the origins of head wraps in America all the way back to West Africa and the different ethnic groups um, like uh, the Duke or the Gele and how those were tied and the significance of them. Yeah, American we have. American lady says my grandmother would ask, "Why do you have that rag on your head?" Yeah, why do you have that rag <laughs> the on head your rag? Head? <laughs> so I'm going to ask a question mm -hmm. because we talked about appropriation, mm -hmm. and so what if somebody who is into vintage mm -hmm. styling mm -hmm. wants mm -hmm. to wear one of these? How do you feel about that if they are not mm -hmm. a person of color? I'm sure that um, I think that this one is a great one for like. The Rommel actually is really good for vintage styling. Mm -hmm. um, uh, any one of them, they can right. wear. They can if wear they wore as... it in a certain type of, if they yeah. wore it on their head, I guess that's what I'm getting at. Yes. If they wore it on their head, it's the way they put it on their head. I we have say... a nice video, yeah. Yeah, which that is Chaney uh, did that Cheney did yeah. with <laughs> us, and she does not do um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, cultural head wraps. Yeah. She does vintage and you know mm -hmm. retro head wraps. Yes. Um, with some of our products, right? Absolutely. And as does uh, Christina. And those types of styles, I think, are fine mm -hmm. yes. with any one of these. Ab absolutely. Um, and I, I think it's important to note that uh, anglicized white women mm -hmm. in America would not have wanted to wear a head wrap the way in which black women wore them. It would have identified them as being black, which exactly. during that time, um, that is something that they were not associated, wanted to be associated with. Yeah. Today, um, people love black culture. I'm not sure I could say that they love black people, but they love black culture. And so everything black culture is popular. So we're, Everyone these days has have lived in a world in which black culture is extremely popular. Mm -hmm. So everyone wants to, hip hop is very popular. And even before them, jazz and blues and oh, that yeah. scene was very popular. But this was a time period where people did not want it to distance themselves. So um, it, it wouldn't even be accurate. Yeah. Um, during the period to wear a head wrap exactly. the same way. You don't you don't yeah. find it anywhere. If you're looking at, at contemporary 
um, paintings, genre paintings, not necessarily <laughs> portraits, but genre paintings, you just mm -hmm. don't find it. You don't yeah, find you it. Don't see it. Um, it's um, not there. Judith has a question about how many of these head wraps might an enslaved person own versus a free person, mm -hmm. and would it have to do with the cost of acquiring or making mm -hmm. the textile? Uh, that's a good question. Um, there, I think, I, I don't have an answer for that because they barely talked about head wraps in the mm -hmm. WPA narratives, barely. So um, knowing exactly how many, but I can get an idea of the usage, uses. I find that they would have maybe one or two work head wraps, mm -hmm. um, and then they would have a special Sunday meet. So if they're gonna wear it, usually a crisp white one, for yeah. when something very special or a, you know, you sometimes see silk, um, something really nice like a, a madras. Like in silk, yeah. Yeah, so you absolutely see, um, but people would pick, would have something very special for sa Sabbath uh, or Saturday, or I'm sorry, for Sunday. I grew up some day in this, if you can tell. <laughs> um, and if they weren't wearing their hair out. So sometimes underneath these, head wraps, their hair is, are in twist or being stretched to do a pin up style, a pin, a pin more European style for Sunday, mm -hmm. um, if they are not wearing a head wrap. The, so in, uh, to say a little more about that, have you ever done any, um, been able to find any free um, people of color any type of documentation for any type of wills. Wills, I don't think they would will. Yeah. They, you're not gonna will their head wraps or. Um, yeah, exactly, that's why yeah. I'm asking <laughs> yeah. because I, I don't know, you know, because of the whole, I, mm -hmm. the whole culture of mm -hmm. willing clothing in yeah. the 18th century, you mm -hmm. know, it's, I'm curious as to that how would it would. That would be interesting. Yeah, I wonder uh, if it's another avenue yeah. to explore is what yeah. I'm saying. Uh, if. If anyone has any yeah, uh, wills anything. of free black folks, yeah. let me know. Yeah. Um, also, I do. I mean, things are, we're finding that there is a lot more out mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. It's just not been talked Absolutely. about. Absolutely. You know, and that's the sad part mm -hmm. about it, but at least it's mm -hmm. coming out now. Yeah. Um, and so there so, is more out there. There's more to be found, a lot mm -hmm. more to be found. Yes. Um, he and has a question. If uh, Would these have been part of the wardrobe purchase to dress enslaved people? Um, she said specifically really, for auction. I'm thinking uh, of the stores in, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, Shaco Bottom? Shoko, Shaco, Shaco, Shaco Bottom. Shaco Bottom. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, I think something like this. Yeah. This would have been considered, we know for a fact actually that kerchiefs were within um, allotments for in the mid 19th. Yeah, allotted to enslaved persons. Um, so something like this, sometimes they would have a lot of kerchief, but sometimes they would allot a certain amount of cloth to mm -hmm. an enslaved person. Um, when we're looking at um, 18th century, I see more of just allotting a certain amount of fabric. Right. And if there's something that you can um, get from that fabric that is a head wrap, but I want to stress that most of the black women I see in households do not have a head wrap at all. Yeah, and especially they're, they're in Virginia, been they've been well. They've, well, they've been. no, I mean they are not wearing any type of head covering. Oh, no head so covering. So if you okay. see the three original yeah. 18th century black women, enslaved black women you see. One that's owned by Colonial Williamsburg. Yeah. Yeah. And the only one I know of where you actually see a black person, a black woman with a head wrap on is on the old, the old plantation. Right. Colonial Williamsburg one But too. they're outside. But they're outside. Yeah, they're outside. They're outside. And they're, they're having a celebration. Yeah. The, um, one of the things I wanted to speak to for 18th century when it comes to, uh, allotments for the enslaved, she's absolutely right that oftentimes it's fabric and, and there's an yeah. understanding behind that because you do see um, uh, breaches being made for my for my man so-and-so or, or waistcoats. Yeah. Those are tailor's pieces. Mm -hmm. Things that can be sewn by mm -hmm. the women are being sewn by the women. So yeah. there are allotments for textiles. Mm -hmm. So it, very easily they could take a piece of Osnabrück or what have you, mm -hmm. and make 
a kerchief yes. for themselves yes. as well. And I um, would also look at um, shop records mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. enslaved persons, it blows people's minds how much they were buying mm -hmm. in, at stores. Mm -hmm. But there's, a, the, and that has to do with the ability, depending, depending, yes. the ability to be able to do things for themselves to make their own money. Yeah. Um, and that could be anything from having skilled labor yes um that they were allowed to use you can imagine how hard they must have worked because you know how much hard they worked to begin yes. with yeah. but having um skilled labor yeah. or even small things yeah. like trading yeah, chickens. Uh, having mm -hmm, mm -hmm. keeping chickens having a mm -hmm. uh, garden mm -hmm. uh, and doing trades and you see that in shop mm -hmm. records a lot where you have trades and sometimes uh, if they're like, if they are skilled at weaving, mm -hmm. they're trading cloth for cloth yeah. or trading cloth for other goods. Yeah. So, cloth yeah. was um, the currency of uh -huh. the enslaved community. Mm -hmm. um, so you see a lot of, when you see runaway ads, um, you see they are taking a lot of clothes with them. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's because they want to be able to meld into the free black right. population. But other times they are trading their way to freedom. So along the way you could trade, I could possibly trade one of these kerchiefs uh, for a loaf of bread or exactly. something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Like, that made me cute. think of Deidre and the, oh, and, yeah. the, and the program they just did. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, did anybody have any other questions for we us? Are, we're good on questions and we're actually just at time. We're so. just at time. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> You guys, yes, we really hope that you enjoyed this live, even with our technical difficulties. But I know you want to take them home. No, they're my sample. Right. Um, um, but we, you know, we are just very excited. This yeah. is only the beginning. We've already yes. been sitting down the office thing going, oh, we could do this. Right, right. We could do it, right? So it's, um, we hope that this is. Uh, inspiration for yeah. you mm -hmm. that's it it adds to your learning mm -hmm. coffers yeah. that it is something that um, also will make you think about mm -hmm. the idea of bringing people to the right. table I really right. like the way mm -hmm. Janie puts that mm -hmm. bringing others to the table and collaborating um, so that we can bring the full history yeah. to life because I think that says it absolutely yeah and um, stop waiting for people um, to make what you want to use mm -hmm. and make your world the way you want it to be. Exactly. I'm, I'm just waiting for the awesomeness, the awesomeness that is Gen Z to roll through mm -hmm. and just do amazing things. I can't wait to see, um, number one, what you all will be doing with these curves. With those things, yes. Um, and I also can't wait for the creations you all are making in the future. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, there's there's a really amazing group of people coming up that their their inspiration and their enthusiasm and their intelligence oh. is just and and they are not restricted yeah. as some of us have been yeah. in our lifetimes. So go for uh, it, everybody. Yeah. Go for it. Well, everybody is saying thank you so much. So you oh, good. Thank you. we'll show you after we. Get <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well. I have to thank Teeny because we've had the best time I and now know. I don't want her to go home. We've had a little so, bit too much fun. <laughs> yeah, we've had a little too much fun and I don't want her to go home, but this is this is going to be so much fun yeah. and you need to keep an eye out because mm -hmm. Cheney will make the announcement and then you'll mm -hmm. see us make our announcement yeah. and we'll hope to have all of this ready to go for you guys very soon. And we hope to see you using this to tell the story. Absolutely. The whole story. The, the whole, whole story. story. That's it. <laughs> hashtag American history. <laughs> yes. Yep. Hashtag real American history. Right, right, hashtag. right. Hashtag all American history. All Yay. American history. Okay. All right. Say goodbye, ladies. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>